Hey guys, and welcome back to Just Ask Jason. This week, we're talking about heresy. And we're using it as a springboard into our next sermon series, where for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at different heretical teachings that either continue in the church today, or at least influence the way we think about true doctrine in some Area. So I think that'll be super useful anytime that we can self-reflect and we can look at our beliefs and really just dig in and ask, is what I believe about whatever issue biblical? I think that's really helpful to our walk with Jesus. So today we're going to kind of uh, set the table for that. And ultimately the question we want to answer is, should Christians learn about heresy? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. But before we get into that, we need to uh, answer two things. First of all, we need to define heresy. Just say, hey, when we use that word, what does it mean? And second of all, we need to ask why heresy is a big deal at all. Defining heresy is not an easy task for a Protestant. And the reason is that the, I guess, standard definition of heresy is some sort of departure from common teaching or from orthodox teaching. Uh, but there is no such thing as orthodox Protestant teaching because there's no like great board of Protestants getting together and going, well, this is what we believe and nobody can teach anything different other than these five things that we've laid out. Like We don't have that. But other churches, other traditions do especially the Catholic Church, where standard teaching is laid out by Scripture and by their ruling bodies, by the College of Cardinals and by the Popes. And so over time, they've developed a list of things that are standard teaching, and they've also, with that process, had to define what heresy is and what it is not. So I find it extremely useful in some situations like this where Protestants just can't really cover the bases as a Protestant pastor to go to the Catholic Church and say, hey, what do the Catholics say about this? It can be super, super helpful to kind of frame the discussion. Uh, as irreverent as it sounds, I tend to kind of see the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church as like the relationship like between a father and a son or like a mother and a daughter, like a strained parental relationship. Uh, and that's because the Protestants were kind of out here and we're like, no, we can do things better than you. We're going to do things our own way. And then every once in a while we run into an issue like heresy that we kind of can't handle just because our traditions aren't old enough. And then we're like, wait, no, I need to call dad and ask what he thinks. So I know that's like really irreverent, but that's kind of how I view it. And frankly, I'm okay with that sort of relationship. I think it can be healthy. So the Catholic Church defines heresy basically in two big chunks. They work with that standard definition of like it's a departure from orthodox or from standard teaching, like what the church says it believes. Uh, but they have two different flavors, if you will. The first one is what they call material heresy, which is essentially where someone is taught poorly or is mistaken about something, but they had no realistic way of knowing the truth. Either they were never taught the truth or they were never uh, presented with it in such a way that they were able to accept it or something along those lines. So essentially you just have someone that was mistaken. They're still wrong. It's still a heresy, but the Catholic Church says that is not a sin that is held to their account because, essentially, they couldn't have known better. The second one is the one that we're more concerned about, and that's formal heresy, which is where you have a person who is a confessing, baptized member of the church, and they say, yeah, I agree with everything the church teaches, and I understand it all, and like I've been taught well, and I'm good to go, and then at some point, they just decide, nah, I know better, and then they start rejecting some core tenet of the church. And that's called formal heresy, and the Catholic Church does consider that to be a sin. And I think those definitions are super, super helpful, because like I said, as Protestants, we don't really have like a formal ruling body that gets together and defines heresy for us. That being said, Protestants do generally agree with the early church councils, like before we kind of broke up with the Catholic Church. There's a handful of councils called ecumenical councils. We usually agree with those, and we usually have like a general understanding that certain groups 
are heretical groups, groups like the World Mission Society, which teach that Jesus was reincarnated and that the Holy Spirit is a female deity. And it's strange, but we generally agree that groups like that are not Christian and are heretical. So that's kind of our working definition of heresy. It's departure from the core doctrine of the church, and it kind of falls into two camps, kind of unwitting heresy and then people who like know they're doing wrong and just decide that they know better and keep teaching it anyways. Why is heresy such a big deal anyways? Why does it matter if someone decides, well, I want to follow God, but I just don't agree with the church on X, Y, Z? The answer to that, well, in many cases is it doesn't matter. Most of the things that we argue about, they aren't heresies. They're differences of interpretation. What we're talking about with heresies is core differences, things like the divinity of Jesus or even the existence of God. They're things that if you don't believe, you're not a Christian by definition. And the term heresy is in most translations of the Bible, not going to show up at all, but it is equivalent to the, the ideas of division and false teaching that we do see show up in the New Testament. So while there's lots of texts that we could look at that would broadly apply to what we call heresy today, there's two specifically that I want to look at here. The first one is 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 18. Uh, I'm not going to read these because we actually have a lot of texts we'll need to touch on today. But 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 18 which teaches that false teaching is like an infectious skin disease, which is a pretty visceral image. Uh, and Paul says in this passage that it destroys faith, that false teaching destroys faith. And since faith is essential to pleasing God and is essential to salvation, as most Christians believe, uh, it's a big deal when someone says or when something is taught that can destroy an individual's faith. So that's the first answer. False teaching or true heresy can destroy the faith and destroy the salvation of Christians so it cannot be accepted in the church. Uh, the second one or second passage we want to look at is 2 Peter 2, 1, which in some translations does use the word heresy, but the word being translated there is probably best translated as sect or division or something along those lines. The idea is that the creation of a sect here is a sect or a group that disagrees on a core matter with the main church. So it's a not just a, a club, but it's like a heretical pseudo-church that's being created. And these sects or heresies are described as coming from false prophets and being destructive or ruinous. In other words, being bad for the unity and spiritual health of the congregation. So if something is destructive, ruinous, and bad for the spiritual health of those who hear it, it's probably not something we should be teaching and embracing in the church. If heresy is so destructive, then why should we learn about it at all? Uh, probably the best way I've ever heard this phrase is by a Franciscan monk uh, by the name of Casey Cole. And he says this, he says, Nothing forces you to get the right answer quite like hearing lots of wrong ones. He said that at the beginning of a video he put out on the topic of heresy. I'll link to that in the description, and I would recommend checking out his resources. Um, he's obviously very Catholic because he's a Franciscan monk. Uh, so if you're a Protestant, you'll probably hear him say things that you're like, yeah, I'm not sure about that, or I'm not sure if that applies to me. But I'm a Protestant too, and I think that his resources are terrific and are super, super helpful. So definitely go check him out, You know, give him a subscribe, like his videos and stuff. Great, great resources. But nothing forces you to get the right answer quite like hearing lots of wrong ones. So why should Christians learn about heresies? It's not so that we can embrace them and work them into our theology. We should learn about heresies so we can know the wrong answers. Because if you know the wrong answers, it's easier to find the right ones. Just to kind of help you wrap your minds around the process that we'll be going through the next few weeks, I want to give you an example of a heresy that we're going to not be dealing with in the sermon series, but it's still really common in the church today. So obviously in four weeks, we can only cover so many different heresies, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of them in the history of the church. So here's one that we're not going to cover in the next couple weeks, at least not cover all aspects of, and that is 
non-Trinitarian Christianity. Standard Christianity believes that God is one, but exists in three persons. There are seven statements that we can make about God that are true that kind of illustrate this. The first one is there is only one God. Second, the Father is God. Third, the Son is God. Fourth, the Holy Spirit is God. Fifth, the Father is not the Son. Sixth, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. And seventh, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. All of those statements are true. They're also really complicated when you list them out like that. It's hard to keep them all straight. So if you're a visual learner, here's an illustration. This is called the Trinitarian Shield, and it's just a visual representation of those seven statements that I just made. It's meant to be an illustration of God. There is only one God, but three distinct and equally divine persons that are all equally known as God, or as Yahweh, if you prefer the ancient, uh, the ancient term. Now, there are texts, plenty of texts, actually probably well over a dozen at least, uh, in the New Testament that pretty clearly point to this reality or to aspects of this reality. Uh, we'll just touch on one today, which is Galatians 4, 4 through 6, which explicitly mentions the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as distinct persons. And we can name, like I said, a dozen or more texts, but if you want them, just go Google search Trinitarian Bible verses, and you'll pull up tons of lists. If you want to read some articles about it, the Gospel Coalition, uh, it's literally just a website, the Gospel Coalition, I think .org, has some wonderful resources on the Trinity where they explain it really clearly. And if you're a little bit more scholarly, then my favorite resource for describing the Trinity is an ancient document called the Athanasian Creed. If you look it up, just Google it, you'll pull up a copy of it. The Athanasian Creed is an ancient document that, while it's a bit wordy, explains the Trinity wonderfully. So that's kind of our, our starting point. That is what's orthodox, what is agreed upon teaching in the church. Now here's about four heresies that contradict that. We can learn aspects about the Trinity with uh, as we, well, reject them. The first heresy related to the Trinity is Arianism, which we actually will talk about in a sermon, so sorry, I lied a little bit. Uh, but this view basically denies that Jesus is divine or is as divine as God the Father is. Uh, essentially, uh, the person who this was named for, Arius, uh, believed that Jesus wasn't God, but was rather a powerful being created by God. And there's a few like pseudo-Christian sects that still buy into something similar to this, uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, that believe that Jesus and Michael the Archangel are the same person and Jesus is a created being. Uh, our response to that is John chapter 1. There's plenty of other texts we could point to, but John 1 is probably the clearest, where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, or Hologos, is just another title for Jesus. So John 1, right at the beginning of John's Gospel, he says, in the beginning was Jesus, and, the G and Jesus was with God, the Father, and Jesus was God. That's pretty cut and dry. Arianism, not true, not Trinitarian. It is a heresy. Second of all is what's called tritheism, which is the belief that each of the members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are all independent gods. This is just blatant heresy. Uh, Christians believe that there is only one God. One of the clearest places we see, not only Christians, but Jews and Muslims as well, believe that there is only one God. God, and this is stated really clearly in Deuteronomy 6, 4. This is called the Shema, which roughly translates to hear. Uh, and Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Like, there's not really any way to say it more clear than that. There is one God, the Shema, clearly rejects tritheism. There's only one God, even if that one God exists within three, or as three persons. Uh, third is what's called dynamic monarchianism, which is weirdly fun to say. It's sometimes called adoptionism, which is easier to say. And it's the idea that the father is divine, 
and that Jesus was just a really pious person that God adopted and gave special powers or special status to. Uh, and our response to that is, well, in addition to the text we've already talked about, John 3.16 is another one. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten normally is used to describe like having children, which doesn't really make sense when it comes to God, but it, it refers to actual physical birth, to physical descent. And the concept in an ancient mind is if you are physically descended from someone, then you are of the same substance as them. So the statement here theologically that John's trying to make in John 3.16 is that Jesus, the Son, is of the same substance as God. In fact, he is the only incarnated or in the flesh being that can claim that. So God, the Father, and the Son, if they are of the same substance and there is only one God according to the Shema, well, they must be the same God in different persons. Unfortunately, explaining it that way is exceedingly close to our fourth heresy that we're covering today, and that is another form of monarchianism called modalistic Monarchianism, which is probably the most popular heresy in the church today. Fortunately, it's probably what Catholics would call a material heresy rather than a formal heresy. It goes something like this. This is the belief that the members of the Trinity are not distinct persons that exist as one God, but rather are aspects or modes or forms in which a single person, a single mind, chooses to exist. The fancy theological term for that would be uh, a theophany. But the idea is that these different beings are not really different beings or different persons at all. It uh, also could be called uh, extreme monotheism, although that's not exactly the most fair way to phrase this. The point being, uh, this is... Well, a heresy, but like I said, probably a material heresy in most cases. Uh, our response to it is Matthew 28, 19, which is also called the Great Commission, which insists on all three members of the Trinity rather than reaffirming the Shema. So rather than saying, uh, go and baptize in the name of God, Jesus says, go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He draws attention to all three members of the Trinity not just saying, hey, just go baptize in the name of God. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because it's important to Jesus that we understand that God is one, like the Shema says, but he exists in three persons. So modalism or modalistic monarchianism, it cannot be true. Jesus, or God does not just show up in different forms. He is actually three distinct persons, yet still of the same substance. Like I said, uh, the Athanasian Creed really, really phrases this well. Go look it up. Go read it. Seriously, like go think about it and read it and dwell on it and meditate on it because it's a super helpful document to kind of wrap your brain around how the Trinity works. Just putting a bow on things here, here's the four things that we have learned today. By rejecting Arianism, then we have learned that Jesus wasn't just a powerful created being, but he actually was of one substance with God, co-eternal with him, like the Athanasian Creed states. By rejecting tritheism, we have reaffirmed the firmly biblical teaching that there is only one God. Even if that God exists in three persons, there's only one God. We're not polytheists. Sec or third of all, by rejecting dynamic monarchianism or adoptionism, we've rejected the idea that Jesus was just a really special person. He was more than that. He was God in the flesh. And fourth, by rejecting modalism, we've reaffirmed that each member of the Trinity is a unique person. And that is immensely important to a, a full and powerful understanding of Christian scriptures. Now, I know that all of that is heady. I know it's hard to wrap your minds around. I know you might have to listen to this lesson again or go find someone else who explains it better than I do. And I hope you do those things. But I hope at the very least you can walk away from this uh, conversation with one truth in your mind. And that is that by learning and rejecting ancient 
heresies or even modern heresies, we actually can become deeper in our faith. And I think this applies broadly across not just heresies, but even skeptical theories or or other religions. When we learn aspects about other belief systems, ones that are not true, and then we hold them up to the light of Scripture and we find rational reasons to reject them and compassionate ways to respond to them, we actually grow in our faith as Christians. It buttresses our faith simply to learn about things that are wrong and figure out why they're wrong. So I hope that that is helpful to you. I hope it inspires you to go out there and to learn more about more ancient heresies and to learn uh, Orthodox Christian responses to them. And if you feel firm in your faith and you feel like you're well-equipped for it, I hope you go out and you learn skeptical theories and arguments against Christianity as well, and you learn to respond to those. Because when we do, we become smarter, we become closer to God, we grow our faith, and I think it is immensely valuable to the church. So God bless you. I'm praying for you, and I hope to see you Sunday. If you can... Uh, Drop a like and a subscribe and all that. It's super helpful to us. And I'll see you back here next week.